All right, we are back for the second uh, hour of class on Monday, June 22nd. This is the second part of chapter 16. Keep in mind, homework one is due on Wednesday. We'll be finishing up chapter 16. The homework assignments are always due the day that we uh, finish a chapter. So keep, uh, keep that in mind and always check the schedule for all those deadlines. And I'll remind you on the board, of course. And then quiz one, which is uh, the review quiz, topics from Chem 351 is due on Thursday. So recitation help will be available for that. And remember the due dates there and the time is midnight at 11.59 on Learning Suite, but don't push that. Make sure you get things uh, done well ahead of time. All right, we left off with this topic here. We were talking about uh, butadiene and we we're looking at the structure of it and butadiene, 1,3-butadiene here. And here we're showing the pi bonds with all the uh, p atomic orbitals. And you know, if you look at this and you look at the, the shading or the phase of those p atomic orbitals, remember that's the, an orbital is the probability of where the electrons are. And the shading, dark and light, has to do with the sign of the wave equation. It's a quantum mechanical idea. If they're in phase, we say that's what? A, uh, a, a pi bond, okay? That's a low energy uh, interaction. Uh, if they're out of phase, that's a pi star, an anti-bonding arrangement. But I've got them all in phase right now. And what you see is, is this really a double bond like we depict here? And what about that? We show it as a single bond in these normal structures that we draw. But look at that. Is this really a, a single bond? No, if we draw them in phase, that will have some pi character, won't it? And same thing over there. And if we compare some bond lengths here, bond lengths can be very accurately determined using X-ray crystallography. We know the bond length of a typical isolated pi bond, a double bond like ethylene, that bond length is 1.34 angstroms. An angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. And if we look at the bond length of ethane, the typical alkane that's sp3 hybridized, we see it has a bond length of 1.54 angstroms, quite a bit longer. Well, why is that? Well, the shorter bond is because we have more electrons between the two positively charged carbon nuclei, so they're, they're able to shrink down and come down a little bit uh, shorter that way. And a triple bond, what's the bond length of that? Anybody remember that? Yeah, it's like 1.2 angstrom, even, even shorter, because there's six electrons there. Well, what about butadiene now? Uh, here and here and here. The bond length of interest is right there. What's that bond length? Well, if, if it was a typical single bond, it'd be about 1.5, right? But if it was more double bond, it would be 1.34. So what do you think it is? If there's pi overlap here, is it going to be a little bit shorter? As short as this one, as a true isolated double bond, or will it be kind of in between? Okay, yeah, so it is in between. Let's see what it exactly is. It's uh, 1.48 uh, angstrom, so it's kind of in between the two. So we'll need to look at the consequences of that. We'll look at the molecular orbital diagrams and figure that out with a little more detail. First, I'd like to go through on the board here a little bit more on allylic cations. So we talked about uh, uh, <clears throat> cations last time. I showed you a little bit on mechanisms coming up. So here's your typical allyl cation, the simplest one, uh, which has three uh, carbons involved. And all pi bonds there, you could say this carbocation right here is an empty P atomic orbital, but it's delocalized over what, the three atoms there, so it's a little bit different. Then we have others that are a little more substituted, right? We have this uh, propenyl cation that has five carbons, and we can have cyclic ones as well. So these are all allylic cations, and we can talk about resonance of each one of those. Before we get into the details of that, let me show you some experimental information here. So here's a reaction of a, what, a tertiary? cation, terbutyl, uh, cation, terbutyl chloride, and we're going to put it in ethanol. So what type of reaction is that going to be? That's right, it's an SN1 reaction. This is not charged, but this is tertiary. So we could expect ionization here. 
and the intermediate's going to be this terpetal cation. And then what? The solvent can attack here and generate the product. Now, I'm not going to do the whole mechanism. We have to lose the proton off the intermediate here, but we get the ethyl what ether here, terpetal ethyl ether. And that's a certain type of reaction. Let's compare it to this now. So here's a, another tertiary chloride, but it's got this alkene here, and we're going to put it in ethanol, same conditions as terpetal chloride, okay? And we're going to get a product here. Uh, it's this product right here, okay? Um, it, but it goes, let's see, the relative rate of these reactions. Let's normalize this right here. And this is a pretty fast rate. This is done in just... Uh, uh, minutes. I think it's 15 minutes or so that we'll go to this maximum here. But we're going to normalize that rate to 1. And we're going to compare the rate here to this tertiary cation, okay, with the alkene right here. What do you think? Is this reaction going to be faster or about the same as this one? And how much faster? Let's see. Yes, it's significantly faster. It's 123 times faster normalized to this being 1. Okay, this is done in 15 minutes. This is done just in a few seconds. Well, why is that? Let's look at the mechanism here. We've got a neutral nucleophile. It involves ionization. Our intermediate is going to look like this, where we have what? The tertiary carbocation. And what's the difference now? This is a localized tertiary carbocation. This one is delocalized, right? It's got the resonance effect. So we can push those electrons over, and we have a primary carbocation right now. That's not as good as the tertiary one, but we have this resonance effect between the two. Okay, Let's look at another reaction real quick. Let's take that same uh, carbocation that we can get the allylic carbocation from this tertiary chloride, and let's react it in water. I've got the two products here. It's a mixture of two alcohols. Now we just have water as our neutral nucleophile. We get this alcohol, plus we get what? We get the alcohol right here. Which one do you think is dominant? Yeah, the tertiary one. It's 85% here to 15% uh, there. Now, yeah, so most of the carbocation, the, the positive charge is born at the tertiary position. You remember, tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary, more stable than primary. And that's that hyperconjugation effect. But now, now we have the extra effect, seeing the faster rate now, and we have the allylic uh, carbocation from before. Now, this is an interesting example because we can take this isomeric allyl chloride here. It's a different starting material than this one. This is a tertiary chloride. This is primary. But look, the intermediates are going to be the same here. Now let's do it under the same reaction conditions and see if there's something fundamental about this process. Yeah, what are going to be the products? Again, it's going to be this product right here. It's the same product. And guess what? It's the same ratio, 85-15, okay? These two products are the same coming from this isomeric form. Now, why is that? Again, both of these intermediates involve what? This allylic carbocation. And I'll draw it as the delocalized thing. That represents the two resonance forms, the resonance hybrid there, where the carbocation can be here or here. <laughs> so we've got that difference there from that same isomeric product. Now, let's establish a little more fundamental idea about the molecular orbitals of this allylic cation. And we'll go back and look at the molecular orbitals of butadiene, having the two conjugated alkenes together. So let's go back to the board up here, move the camera up here and look at the, uh, the overheads. And I guess I've got a, kind of a fun thing here first to look at. <laughs> the Polyene Hall of Fame showing you some examples here. <laughs> Very different types of compounds, but they're all polyenes. They have multiple alkenes. This one, allium from, yes, garlic. And yes, it's responsible for the nasty smell and the taste of garlic. It's a disulfide. And the two alkenes right here, you can see my... Uh, my mouse cursor here, a little hand moving over. I think that shows up a little better than the laser pointer, does it? Let's see. Let's just compare that. 
Yeah, the laser pointer is not showing up too well. So let me just you know point out things there. So what type of a diene is this? It's a diene. Remember, we had three types of dienes. What were they? Isolated, conjugated, and cumulated. Now, what type of a diene would this be? Are they right next to each other? No, so it's an isolated diene. Cyanine dyes, here we have a polymeric thing. So many alkenes in between these alkenes here, and they are right next to each other. So these synthetic dyes here are what? These are definitely conjugated polyenes. They have isoprene also in nature here, the precursor to rubber or gutta percha from the rubber tree. Isoprene is indeed a what? A conjugated diene. But rubber, when the tree polymerizes this stuff, it makes this stretchy rubber stuff, this white latex material. <laughs> and uh, we have many, the X means repeating unit there. And notice there's a methylene here and a methylene here. So rubber, what type of a polyene is that? Good, isolated. It's not conjugated right there. How about periplanon? Let's look at that. That's the cockroach pheromone. <laughs> Very interesting stories about that compound, but here you see the diene right here and here. Is that a conjugated diene or a isolated? Yep, conjugated. Uh, Symphostatin, Zocor, this is one of the uh, cholesterol lowering drugs, the statin drugs that lowers serum cholesterol in the body. Very interesting stories about this drug. It is a polyene. Here's the diene right here. Is it conjugated or isolated? Yes, conjugated. <laughs> And then we got lycopene and, oh, carotene first, okay. Uh, carotene from carrots, yep, that's the precursor to vitamin A. Definitely conjugated and lycopene conjugated. We got these lambda max values what, right here. What are those uh, referring to? The lambda max is a value in the ultraviolet spectroscopy. We'll cover that at the end of this chapter. But these are absorbing in the visible range. Remember the visible range in uh, nanometers goes from 400 to 700 nanometers. Uh, that's the only range that we actually see with our eyes. And these are absorbing in that range. This is in the, the blue range, it's absorbing. So these show up what? Uh, orange and red in their color. Remember, it's the colors that are not absorbing. <laughs> These are the, the frequencies that are being absorbed. So what comes through is the uh, unabsorbed light. And then we got squalene. Is that isolated or conjugated? Yep, isolated. You see the intervening sp3 saturated carbons? So these are not right next to each other, not being conjugated. Arachidonic acid also in biology. Again, isolated polyene because of the intervening uh, sp3 uh, CH2 groups there. Okay, let's uh, look at a little bit details here from a molecular orbital basis. Now your book doesn't cover this uh, until chapter 17 with the aromatic chemistry, but I've covered it a little bit in 351 and we'll kind of review a little bit. I know in general chemistry, this is covered uh, to some extent. So molecular orbitals, there's a lot here. You can read through that. Uh, it's kind of good just to look at the examples here. So the molecular orbitals for the molecule hydrogen, the simplest molecule is the linear combination of the two atomic orbitals, and we create two new molecular orbitals. So that's the basis of all MO theory. The same number of atomic orbitals equals the same number of molecular orbitals we form. We can only put two electrons at a time in any orbital, including molecular orbitals. So two go into the low energy sigma bond where the phases of the S atomic orbitals are in, in phase with each other, constructive overlap, which gives the fully shaded uh, molecular orbital, the two electrons there. Here's the uh, depiction of, of the spins being sp spin opposite there. There's a lot more we could talk about, but we have to create two molecular orbitals, right? So here's the second one, the sigma star, and that's where they're out of phase with each other, deconstructive overlap, you see there's a node right there where the probability of finding electrons, yes, goes to zero. That's what a node means. So that's anti-bonding. Now in the ground state for hydrogen, those two electrons go into the, into the in phase sigma bonding orbital right, shown right here, and it is a stable molecule. We can excite one of those electrons and break the molecule apart by promoting an electron from the sigma to the sigma star. So these depictions are, are very useful for understanding structure and reactivity. Now for ethane and ethylene, 
I've gone through this before in 351. Uh, I'll just briefly go through it now. So we're hybridizing here the carbons to sp3 hybridization. And we're only looking at the sigma bond between the two carbons. We could do an analysis of the carbons to the hydrogens on the side here, but that would just make things messier. We're not looking at that. Just look at the carbon-carbon interactions. So here's the sp3 orbitals pointing right at each other, either in phase to create the sigma star or out of phase to create what? the sigma star, I'm sorry, <laughs> they're in phase, it's the sigma. I may have misspoken there, sorry. <laughs> if they're out of phase, that's the sigma star. But the ground state for this bond right here is the two electrons in the bonding orbital right there. But there is a position in space where there's a sigma star, okay, available for that. Again, there's a node right between there. But in the ground state, they're both electrons are in this orbital, which is a bonding orbital. Now go down here to ethylene, and we need to look at what? two bonds being formed, the sigma bond and the pi bond. And those come from two atomic orbitals, so we need two molecular orbitals for each one for a total of four molecular orbitals between the carbons, okay? So we've got sp2 hybridization with a p atomic orbital left behind. So here they are depicted, the p's, and then the ones pointing here on the axis of the bond are what? The two sp2 orbitals pointing right at each other. So that's the sigma bond down here. And then as it gets closer together, it forms the pi bond there in phase. So that's the banana bonds we sometimes call pi bonds. Uh, and and uh, going up in energy, the next one higher in energy is the pi star, okay? The sigma star is always higher in energy. Pi star and pi are right here together. So we have a, a node right between the carbons when we get to the antibonding and then the very high antibonding arrangement with the sigma star. So you've probably heard these two terms also, homo and lumo. Homo refers to what? Highest occupied molecular orbital, that's the pi bond. Those are the two electrons in the pi bond right there, the dots, okay? The lowest energy one is the sigma with the two dots there. And then the LUMO, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, will be the pi star right here. Usually, when we're talking about uh, excitation of pi bonds on saturated units, we're talking about the promotion of one electron from the HOMO to the LUMO, which is almost always a pi to pi star interaction. If there are uh, lone pair non-bonded electrons on an oxygen or a nitrogen, then sometimes we talk about n to pi star promotion. And we'll look at that later on too. But that's that's the basics of that. So let's just focus on uh, the phases here of the uh, p atomic orbitals. And you can see a little more clearly, I think, just looking at the pi and pi star. So for ethylene, that should be pretty straightforward. Sigma or, or psi 1, psi 2, those are the wave equations, the Schrodinger equations. You don't want to see the math for those. You can do those mathematically. We can do these calculations very accurately for simpler molecules, but, but I think the basics of it, seeing it uh, represented here pictorially, uh, quantum mechanics is a lot simpler. So we have the, the bonding, the pi, and the pi star, whether it's in phase or out of phase. And we call that the bonding and the antibonding. So that's pretty straightforward. And there's only two electrons involved in the pi bond. We're not looking at the sigma. This, this is right here, okay? Uh, in between. We're just looking at the pi bond. Let's look at the next one here, which would be the allylic one. Now we've got three carbons involved, and we've got three p orbitals, right? Three p atomic orbitals means what? We need three molecular orbitals looking at the pi bonding within this structure, okay? So we can have them all in phase like this. This is one big pi bond now. <laughs> Or these electrons, if it's in the ground state here at the bottom, this psi 1, there's two electrons that have this like wave properties where they're all in phase together when they oscillate, okay? So yeah, they, it is oscillating here. They have wave-like properties. So it's like a standing wave, like a pluck string on a guitar or a piano string or a violin string. If you're a musician, you're, you're into the harmonics of the strings. <laughs> you can see molecules are similar that way. The lowest energy harmonic or frequency here is where they're all in phase with each other. But there's only two electrons per, per, per molecular orbital. That's the Pauli exclusion principle. They're spin paired. You can't put more than two electrons in an orbital. 
But we have, uh, you know, three atomic orbitals, so we have to have three molecular orbitals. So the next one up's right here, psi two. It looks like this, where we have a node right in the middle. The probability goes to zero at that point, and it oscillates across like this. So that is a higher energy molecular orbital. The node's right in the middle, and there aren't any electrons in there if this is an allyl cation, okay? <laughs> we just have a positive charge there, but the two electrons in this molecular orbital that makes up the three carbons now looks like this, okay? This one's empty. This would be what? The uh, LUMO of an allyl cation. And then the higher energy one is where they're all out of phase, where we have two nodes on the side. So look at the harmonics here, all in phase, oscillating like this, and then oscillating like that. So that's like the octaves on a string, okay? <laughs> you have the nodes where there's no displacement of the string, the first octave, no displacement halfway up the string. If we have three electrons in there, that would be a radical, uh, allylic radical. We'd have a dot there, a single electron up here. Okay, that'd be three electrons. And notice we'd have to put that odd unpaired electron in this orbital right here. It would look like that. So that'd be higher energy, okay? If we have an allyl anion, then we have two electrons there, and we have a negatively charged species. The radical's neutral, okay? The cation is, of course, positive. The anion with four electrons would be negatively charged, okay? So as we go up in energy here, we create more nodes, okay? And we have higher harmonics for that structure. Let's go to the next one, butadiene. This is the last one, okay? <laughs> this is a topic we're talking about, of course, for the reactivity of the butadiene. So we have four P orbitals here, so we need four molecular orbitals. And you see they're arrayed this way. They're all in phase for the lowest one. Two electrons are down there, oscillating in this manner, all in, all in harmony with each other, all overlapping. The next run up has one node symmetrically placed would be right in the middle between C2, C3, where we have an out of phase interaction. The two on the sides there, C1, C2, and C3, C4 are in phase. So this is still a pi bonding orbital right here. And that's where the next two electrons go. And that's okay, this is bonding, this is bonding. That's the depiction for butadiene in the ground state. Notice we have some overlap right here for psi one where they're in phase. So that accounts for, you see, the shortened bond between C2, C3. Even though we draw it as a single bond when we depict it in the, the normal depiction, that's not a true single bond. That has double bond character, it's shorter, right? Then the higher one up, C3 has two nodes on the side. Again, out of phase interaction. That's an anti-bonding orbital, but notice we have overlap between two and three there. And then C4, the highest energy one, they're all out of phase. So that's very high energy. But we can promote electrons there. And in the UV, we can see those transitions between uh, the HOMO and the LUMO here uh, for that. And that's probably all we need to say. Uh, I, I think that's, that's good. Let's go back uh, to the reactivity here and uh, see a little bit more details on the board here, if we could come down to the board. And we'll go through some depictions of resonance structures that hopefully will make a little bit more sense. Uh, we've been doing allylic resonance structures. Let's look at some other types here. So uh, your book group sees in, in four types of resonance structures that we'll see over and over again. The simplest one, We've been looking at is this, of course, where you should be able to push the electrons between the two resonant forms. And this is a symmetric one. We can often just draw it with a dash here and say plus overall. Okay. So, you know, the, the, the true structure is a hybrid between the two. And this really points out a limitation of these static Lewis dot, you know, uh, uh, skeletal figures that we draw. It, it, this is really delocalized over the two. And the molecular orbitals, remember, there's three here uh, for, for the allylic system like that. And we had allyl anion right here. And again, that has resonance, right, where you can have the negative charge over here. I'm not drawing the hybrid there for you. That. And we also have the allylic uh, radical. And we saw that in Chapter 15, remember. Okay, So this is a neutral one. There's just one electron there. 
do your formal charge calculation. That is indeed neutral, but that radical can also be over here. So there's three different types of that allylic resonance. But this also relates to things like uh, heteroatoms, right? So here's an anion that you're familiar with, acetate anion. And again, we've got a pi bond next door to, to the electrons there. So let's go ahead and draw the resonance structure there. Okay. So that's kind of a simple review for you, but that's the same type of allylic resonance we're, we're talking about here. We'll also see later on resonance structures with nitrogens. So here's an enamine, it's called. We'll study enamines later on when we get to the amine chapter. But there's a pi bond next door to a lone pair on this nitrogen. Can that resonate? Yep. Now it's not symmetric, <laughs> a little bit different. So we gotta draw out the charges here. Uh, now we have some charge separation, right? This is neutral here, but this pair of electrons can resonate over here, form a double bond there and push these electrons and pi bond out here to have, a, to have an anion there. So, you know, this resonance structure is not as important as the neutral one. We have charge separation. Remember for resonance structures, we wanna minimize charge separation, but this would be a useful resonance structure. And indeed, enamines are nucleophilic at this position. We'll see that later on. Okay, another type of resonance structure would be, uh, let's see, conjugated dienes. So here's the other one we've been talking about, butadiene. Butadiene have resonance structures? Well, there's the neutral thing. Let's go ahead and push the electrons over here. We can also have this cation anion form. <laughs> that would be higher in energy, of course. It's like the charge separation of the enamine, but that is a resonance structure, okay? We're pushing the electrons, delocalizing them around in the uh, pi system. These are uh, starting out neutral, but you can see we're, we're going uh, to delocalization here. So this is the second type. If it's neutral, we're just pushing the electrons around the ring here in benzene, and you've seen this before, the two resonance structures are that. Uh, sometimes we draw the composite here uh, with a circle in the middle, or we can draw them localized. This will have more importance when we'll get to chapter 18, but these are, again, two resonance structures of uh, neutral types. There's a lot of that type one. Okay, type three resonance structures is where we have a carbocation next door to a heteroatom like oxygen or nitrogen that has lone pairs on it. So we've got two lone pairs here. Let's take one lone pair here, if we've got a cation next door to that. What would be the resonance structure there? Yeah, so it looked like this. Now where's the charge? Initially we had the charge right here on the carbocation. Right, the charge is now on oxygen. Okay. So you can see how that can resonate there and help stabilize that carbocation. Let's see, uh, nitrogen. Yep, nitrogen, similar type of deal here. If we've got a carbocation next door to a nitrogen and amine, this can form a resonance structure there. And we what? <clears throat> we have the plus charge now on the nitrogen. That's an aminium ion. We'll look at aminium ions and imines uh, coming up later on. Type uh, four here. Let's look at just a simple neutral uh, pi system acetone, a ketone. Are there resonance structures for that? Well, we've got lone pairs here. We've got two atoms of different polarity. I think we pointed this out before, right? What's more electronegative, the oxygen or the carbon? Right, the oxygen. So these pi electrons can be polarized toward the more electronegative atom, which is the oxygen in this case. And we get what, three lone pairs on oxygen now, and if that pi, those pi electrons have come out, we've got a plus charge. Are we done with that structure? No, we've got a charge on that oxygen, right? <laughs> Draw out your formal charge things and keep, keep track of that. We can also do it with triply bonded species. That's a nitrile or a cyanide. Can we move the electrons there and have a resonance structure? Yeah. The nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon. So what do we have here? We'd have the carbon with, uh, with no, <laughs> there's no hydrogen there, right? We just pulled this out. 
So we've got a cation there, and the nitrogen now bears what a negative charge. <laughs> so some of those have resonance structures that we can look at. Now, <clears throat> let's look at one where we kind of combine these ideas. So this is the four types. We'll see these over and over again throughout the, the, the term. Let's see here one where we've got some combined ideas. So how about this structure? If we draw this, and we've got a cation here. Can you draw some meaningful resonance structures of that? Well, we could just move the electrons around the benzene ring. That's kind of a degenerate <laughs> uh, resonance structure. And again, a resonance structure that regenerates the same structure is <laughs> called degenerate, not as important there. But well, we got lone pairs here, and we could move these electrons out here. And let's see, we get this resonance structure. And then we move that uh, positive charge, you see, into the ring. Okay, and that isn't the only one. What else could we do? Well, you know, we could move the electrons around here, around there, so there's actually multiple ones here. But what about this one? The lone pairs are right next door here, so we'd have this resonance structure also. So let's see what that looked like. Double bond still there, yep. And then the plus charge on oxygen right there. So those are three resonance structures. But there are many more. You can come up with some more. But that combines a couple of the ideas. Now our last topic here before we uh, wrap up is going to be the conformation of, uh, of polyenes and their relative stabilities. So let's look at this on the board here for a second. And I've got the models here to go through this idea. So conformation. What do we mean by that? If there are bonds that we can rotate around, remember we did gauche and anti, you know, butane conformations last time rotating around sigma bonds. Well, we've got a sigma bond here, right? We've got butadiene, and I'll start with it in that conformation there, where they're all, you know, in phase, with, so it's all planar there. But let's rotate around this bond if it has single bond-like character, we should be able to rotate. And we won't be breaking the resonance overlap at C2, C1, C2, and C3, C4, but we're just breaking the resonance around what? C2 and C3. And if we do that, and this is equilibrium now, we're moving the molecule around. We'll keep this one in the plane of the board, but this one will be up out of the plane of the board now, okay? And we'll have to go to the models here to see this a little more clearly. So here we've got resonance between C2 and C3. Here, no, we're out of resonance, okay? Here's the pi bond here, but here it is kind of perpendicular now. In the models, it'll be a little more clear. So no resonance here. And then we'll keep rotating and we'll get over to this conformation, okay? Where we're back in resonance, and notice we've got a difference here between these two on the end. We have this one here where the two double bonds are kind of down toward each other. And this one here where the two double bonds are across from each other. What are we going to call these two? <laughs> That's right. This is S cis. And the S we're referring to rotation around the sigma bond. This is different than alkene geometric isomer cis and trans. Remember, that was this, where we had a double bond and two groups here. That's the cis one, and we had the trans one. And there's actually no equilibrium there, okay? There we have to excite an electron and isomerize that around. We have reactions to make these specifically cis and trans. But here we're talking about the conformation of polyenes. This is different. We're rotating around the sigma bond in the middle, calling it S cis, okay? It's still benefiting from resonance, but notice it's further away from this one. So what are we going to call this one? Yeah, S trans, okay? And this one's just out of resonance. This one is, is out of uh, conjugation there. It's perpendicular to that, okay? So we're not going to call it. In fact, that's the transition state between these two. These are lower in energy. Let me give you those energy numbers. The S cis is higher in energy by 2.8 kcals. Not much, 
than the S trans, which is actually zero kcals per mole. This is the low energy one. The higher energy is the S cis, but not by much, 2.8 kcals. What about this one? If we lose the resonance, and actually this one's a depiction of how much we value that resonance energy. This one is higher in energy by 6.7 kcals. Not much, uh, but you know it is significant, okay? Higher in energy. Let's look at the models here. And if you've got a model set, that's a good thing to break those out and to see these here. So what do we've got here? We've got S cis, okay? And you see the resonance overlap there. You see the two pi bonds being close to each other. And we've got the ability to rotate around that, okay? But let's do it with the same orientation here. So if we rotate this pi bond up like that, we've got the out of plane, no resonance transition state between the two. And if you look at C2, C3 here, you see the pi bonds are perpendicular to each other. So no resonance overlap. Well, let's keep rotating over here to the S uh, trans now. And you see we're back into resonance there. And I could reshade these, you know, where they'd all be blue on top and all red on the bottom. Uh, so don't, don't worry about that right now. But you see that's the S trans arrangement. Now looking forward, the Diels-Alder reaction, we'll see at the end of this chapter, is only going to be available from the S cis. Okay? <laughs> These two pi bonds have to be close to each other in order to do that Diels-Alder reaction. But you can see the uh, energy uh, differences there. Uh, let's do one a little bit harder problem here from this and kind of analyze the conformation of a more substituted uh, polyene. So let's look at this polyene. Maybe we could name that a little bit. So what do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six. This is uh, what? Hexadiene. And it starts at the two and the four position. So it's two, four hexadiene. But let's look at the geometry here. These two, let's look at this alkene separately right here. That's indeed a cis alkene, right? So we call that what? The, uh, the Z, right? And we also have an alkene right here, and that's also the Z, okay? So it's the 2Z, uh, 4Z, uh, hexa, uh, hexadiene, uh, that has the alkene geometries fixed, both of them is easy. But this is what confirmation of that? This is indeed the S trans conformation. <laughs> so we're adding to the complexity. Remember, we learned about E and Z in 351, but this complexity now with polyenes kind of ups the ante a little bit. Now we got to worry about the conformation here. But let's just rotate around that, right? And let's see what we get. That's the S cis. Can we rotate around and get the S trans? Yeah. So if we rotate around there, we can get this. So we just rotated around there. Notice it's still got the Z alkene geometry, both here and here. But just rotating around there, we've got, what, the S cis now. Okay. So that's a little bit different. So we can analyze each one. Which one do you think is lowest in energy? <laughs> and there's a couple reasons here. Yeah, having the S trans arrangement of the diene is going to be lower in energy. And also, what do you notice here about the S cis that would make it higher in energy? Yeah, these two methyls would be pointing right at each other. That would really be higher in energy. In fact, I have that number. <laughs> it's 18.6 kcals per mole higher in energy than the S trans here. <laughs> so it'd be very hard to do a Diels-Alder reaction with this one because it's very high in energy. Uh, the population of this would be vanishingly small. So that, that's definitely a difference there. Um, let's see, to, to wrap up here, sorry, I got one more topic. If we could come back over here to the overheads, uh, we can actually calculate or measure this uh, stability effect that having resonance uh, with polyenes, okay? So this is heat of hydrogenation. We did this for the stability of different alkenes before. So this is comparing the stability of what? An isolated 
octadiene. This is one four pentadiene, and this is what one uh, three pentadiene. So this is the the conjugated one. This is the isolated one. Now, if we take these separately and do hydrogenation reactions with them and measure the heat, we can do this very accurately with a bomb calorimeter. And this is kind of tricky to do. We only do it for a limited amount of time and just get the one hydration at a time. So here's the, the mono hydrogenation, just one alkene being hydrogenated. And that gives off 30 kcals per mole. Okay. And if we hydrogenate it all the way, hydrogenate that last one, that's another 30 kcals per mole. So overall, it's what, 61 kcals per mole? And if we hydrogenate the resonance conjugated diene version now, look, this first monohydrogenation only gives off 26.5 kcals per mole. What's the, uh, the consequence of that? Why is this one 30 and this one's 26? Yeah, well, I'm already giving you the, the info right here. <laughs> it's starting out at a lower point. It has a lower heat of formation. Why? Because it's benefiting from this resonance energy between uh, C2 and C3 here, okay? So it's starting at a lower point in energy, and it's more stable, we say then, right? So when it hydrogenates, it gives off a little less heat, okay? And then this one here is a consequence of what, a disubstitutalkene versus a monosubstitutalkene. So this effect right here is also more stabilizing, okay? Kinetically, it's this one on the end that gets hydrogenated first. There's a lot more we could say about this experiment comparing these two examples. But what I want you to focus on is here we have better stability, lower set point in energy. This is energy going up here in the uh, y-axis. And you can see that we get to the same product in the end, uh, pentane, but we get there differently from the two different alkenes. That's probably all you need to say there. This is just a review of uh, topic in 351 which has to do with alkene stability overall. These are isomers of uh, hexene, C6H12. These are all the same uh, molecular formula, but they're different structures, right? And they get off more heat upon combustion. So this is a different reaction comparing it here. And here's our scale and energy again. Higher energy ones are, are up here higher. Uh, this is less stable by 6 kcals per mole if it's monosubstituted. Di uh, cis substituted, di, remember we have two carbons there, di trans, a little more stable. And then if it's tri substituted isomer or tetra substituted with four carbons on the alkene, that's the most stable form. So this will give off less heat upon combustion. I don't have the absolute kcals per mole coming off here. Uh, I think it's uh, hundreds of kcals per mole for each one of these. But these uh, show you the, the, the differences the, the delta, delta Gs here uh, between that. So the more substituted ones are more stable indeed. Okay, um, next time we'll get into the reactivity. Uh, so stay tuned for class on Wednesday. We'll do the 1-2 versus 1-4 addition reactions. And then we'll also do on Wednesday, the second uh, hour, we'll do the Diels-Alder reactions. So make sure you're read ahead. Those are the key new reactions here for chapter 16. Well, we've gone through all the basics of resonance and the relative stabilities here, and uh, we'll get into the uh, reactivity next time. So very good. We'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you.